So hello everybody. Uh, we will now be showing you Jeremy Eder's talk, which is on managing OpenShift as a service, the Red Hat way. And I will be sharing the talk on a separate uh, hop in window. You could also use the pre recorded YouTube link, which is available in the chat in case there are technical difficulties in the live streaming. And please also keep your hop in window open in another tab for any live QA. Um, and Jeremy is a part of the call uh, to answer any of your questions. In there. I sure wish we were able to be together in Boston or Brno for that matter uh, to see each other in person. Um, but I guess this will just have to do. Welcome to this talk, Managing OpenShift as a Service the Red Hat Way. My name is Jeremy Eater, and I work on the service delivery team at Red Hat, which is the team responsible for building and operating Red Hat's managed services products. Red Hat sells OpenShift as a service in a variety of ways. We sell it on, uh, we sell it and operate it on uh, Azure in the form of Azure Red Hat OpenShift, uh, on AWS and GCP in the form of OpenShift Dedicated, on IBM Cloud in the form of Red Hat OpenShift on IBM Cloud, uh, and of course you can manage uh, self-manage OpenShift. This talk is going to cover three main topics, uh, how we provision clusters, how we manage OpenShift at scale, and how we run production applications on top of one of these managed clusters. Clusters. So let's talk about how we provision clusters first. This is uh, a diagram of our, what we call a service delivery management plane. Um, this is the system by which we generate OpenShift clusters via API. It starts at the front door, which is um, uh, a microservice known as the cluster service. And that guy is built and operated by us. And when coupled by the next component hive, uh, we can provision and lifecycle clusters. So the cluster services job is to lifecycle OpenShift clusters. It does that by telling Hive what to do. Um, any CRUD operation against a managed OpenShift cluster starts and ends with the cluster service. Uh, cluster service has a friend called the account management service, and that's where we keep our business logic, uh, subscription management, feature gates, terms and conditions, uh, the clusters change log, uh, are all implemented in AMS. The last major component of the management control plane is Hive, and Hive has one responsibility to actuate CRUD operations on one or more clusters. Um, Hive is where the OpenShift install itself runs uh, when you create a managed cluster. It's also responsible for adding nodes, uh, adding an identity provider, deprovisioning, uh, and so forth. Incidentally, Hive is Hive also has that same role in Red Hat's Advanced Cluster Manager product or ACM. The service delivery team has also built a uh, an SDK and CLI utilities to manage your. OpenShift dedicated or some upcoming uh, managed products. And I'll show you that now. Um, let's see if I, hopefully you can see my terminal and I will, uh, let's just try and fire it up. So the command line utility for, uh, for managing OpenShift dedicated clusters, which is where we'll start today, uh, is called OCM. I'm already logged in. To OCM, um, I went to cloud.reddit.com. I created an account. I got a token for that account. I have the token in my home directory, and I use that to log in to uh, to log into API.openshift.com, which is where I'm calling it OCM. Um, so yeah, hopefully you can see that text output. It's pretty familiar. Hopefully, pretty familiar to anyone who's used the command line. 
Um, so any, every CRUD operation uh, is, is, is available here, or the majority of them. And uh, let's try and look at creating a cluster. Uh, so first, I would go OCM cluster create. And let's see some of the options that are there for us. Um, so we can set an expiration, which would mean the cluster would be tied off at a certain time, deleted at a certain time. Um, use that for testing. And we can do things like choose AWS or GCP. We can choose which region to run it in, whether it's um, spread across multiple availability zones, which would be a recommendation for any production system. Uh, in that scenario, and I'll, I'll go through a diagram in a second, but in that, in that scenario, um, you know, master nodes are, and compute nodes are split across uh, three availability zones or regions, depending on which provider um, vernacular you're, you're using. So in this case, let's try and create a, uh, an OpenShift dedicated cluster on, uh, on GCP. So they call their regions, uh, US East one would be fine. And I am going to do provider, oops, GCP. And let's call it, I don't know, devconf uh, jeter. Uh, so let's fire that up. And uh, that is the attributes of the cluster as they are uh, initially created. So I've got my name of the cluster. Um, there's a randomly generated subdomain. So you get a unique URL. We also um, and I'll go through this in a little more detail in a second, but there will be a, a Let's Encrypt certificate um, that ties back to that domain. We generate and lifecycle that certificate for every cluster. Uh, in this case, you know, the default topology of this cluster is going to be three masters, three infra and infra nodes, and uh, four compute nodes. Um, and you can you can obviously change the, the number of computes. So um, another option I skipped there is you could choose the instance type, for example, if you wanted larger instances. Um, uh, you know, depending on what your workload is. And obviously you can change the, the quantity of them. Some of these other options aren't too important for this demo, but um, you know, it, it, there it says multi-AZ is false. So yeah, because I didn't select uh, that option when I was creating the cluster. So if I do OCM now describe uh, cluster, I could type uh, dev conf jeter, you'll see a similar output. And this will update as the cluster begins installing. Um, what's happening now, and I'll bring up uh, bring bring up that diagram again. What's happening now is my command line client talked to cluster service, which is which is a microservice behind api.openshift.com, uh, and it cluster service took my options and turned them into an install config for OpenShift. From there. Cluster service generates uh, a CR. So Hive has a CRD called uh, cluster deployment. The install config gets put into that cluster deployment CR as a CR and it gets sent to Hive. So that's what's happened so far. Um, Hive watches those CRs and begins um, you know, taking action once it sees them. So in this case, it's a new cluster create using the attributes that I specified on the command line that are inside the cluster deployment. Hive then takes the installer of the version that I chose. In this case, I didn't specify a version, so it's whatever the default is, um, uh, and begins the install with that version using the install config that was generated by cluster service. So somewhere in the middle, account the AMS I mentioned earlier, account management service, uh, was consulted for subscriptions, was consulted for the fact that I accepted terms and conditions. These are all, you know, just standard contractual stuff. Um, just verified that my account is valid, essentially, the account that I logged into OCM with. Um, and yeah, and so now Hive owns this. Hive is now, like I said, spinning up an install and uh, uh, it usually takes a couple minutes to begin. But after that, the normal OpenShift install period, and um, I'll, I'll show you that in a minute once this cluster is up. I've also uh, created some clusters in advance, as you can imagine. Uh, we just don't have enough time. So we provide an SDK and CLI utilities to manage these clusters. You've seen that. Now, I mentioned we've got three masters, three infra, and uh, four computes. So let's look at what one of these clusters actually is. Um, starting with the master nodes, uh, in this case, 
this diagram represents a multi-AZ cluster. I did not create a multi-AZ cluster, but this is what a real production OpenShift dedicated cluster um, would be recommended topology for it. This is the default topology, incidentally. So you don't have to do anything to get all of this, uh, all of this goodness. So zone one has a master, zones two and three, um, these are within the cloud provider, um, are where each other master lives. So if there's an AZ failure, your uh, master API for OpenShift itself would remain, would remain up. There's an ELB in front of that. So yeah, load balance between those three masters. Um, the infra nodes, which host uh, things like Prometheus and uh, some, some other support operators, um, the registry, several other, other kind of infrastructure related components go there. And uh, there's also three of those nodes and those are also spread amongst the availability zones. Um, the router, of course, probably the most important part of OpenShift. What's the point? There's no router. Uh, also lives on those infra nodes in this case. So that's the control plane. Then the compute nodes, the, the worker pool, so to say, can be of any size, um, up to several hundred nodes. And uh, those are also spread equally amongst the availability zones that are uh, uh, that the cloud provider has um, yeah, provided. So there's EL, several different ELBs, but um, one in front of the masters and then one in front of the infra nodes, which host the routers as well. Access to these clusters could be via uh, public internet, which is the default. And another option I did not specify would be to make the cluster private, um, which means that it cannot be accessed over the internet. Um, it can be accessed only by VPN. So you would set up a connection between your you know, your workstation or your data center more, more likely and or office and um, the cloud provider so that you could connect to these clusters or the, their development clusters or just have some some application that needs more security. Um, privacy is available to you. It's represented here by that VPN icon. So yeah. Um, now we've got this cluster spinning up. You've seen the topology of it. Red Hat um, service delivery it has, over the last couple of years, taken on significant amounts of, of uh, the OpenShift product infrastructure to run on top of OpenShift dedicated. And that's to keep ourselves, you know, as sharp as possible. We want the highest possible SLAs for our own stuff. We want to make sure we have the right operational experience with the most critical applications. It just makes sense to do this. Some of the applications that our uh, teams run are uh, something called telemeter. So every OpenShift cluster will uh, transmit some telemetry data about its health, about its version, and so forth. That's that's all documented in the OpenShift docs. Um, back to Red Hat, and we make product decisions as well as uh, uh, bug severity kind of priority decisions based on data that we collect from the fleet at large. It's fantastic. From an engineering perspective, I, I prefer obviously strongly to be data driven, and that gives us the backing data to prioritize certain bugs over other ones. It also gives us the ability to see what's happening in pre-release versions of OpenShift in the field at large, and to prevent the release of things if we see them before they're stable. So anyone testing in um, candidate channels, or we offer nightly channels actually through uh, OpenShift itself, Anyone testing those versions is still transmitting data back to us. And we use that data to decide as one of the inputs to decide um, whether a, a particular release is ready to go. So that's telemeter. Fantastic. Love it. Uh, Quay, you may have heard of Quay as the registry, uh, free internet registry, uh, container registry. Um, massive, massive amount of data transmit there. I think several petabytes a month. Um, just a gargantuan amount of data. And uh, they use the CDN to, to serve most of it because it's mostly reads, obviously, but that Quay um, clusters also run on OpenShift dedicated. There's several of them. And they uh, serve the container images for every installation of OpenShift, um, for some of the operator uh, downloads, depending on whether it's part of OpenShift or not. And uh, so, so it's critical to us being able to deliver OpenShift clusters, regardless of whether they're managed by us or, or not, you end up hitting uh, Quay at some point or another. Once the cluster's up and running, there's a service called uh, the OpenShift Update Service. You may have heard a code name of Cincinnati. It's called OpenShift Update Service. I'll talk a little bit more about that guy towards the end of the presentation, but um, 
essentially every cluster also checks in for updates occasionally and to check in whether or not uh, new versions are available. And that service is where we would say, oh, you're running this version. You know, you, you would tell us what version you're running or your, your cluster would tell us. And, uh, and we would give you the set of acceptable upgrade paths for you based on the version that you're running. Um, so that runs also on, on OpenShift dedicated. And I've got, again, so some a little bit more deeper analysis on that one later. I mentioned AMS earlier um, and cluster service, incidentally, and OCM in general, the, the red bar on this slide, um, also runs on OpenShift dedicated. So you, see, you can see kind of a trend here uh, in our entitlement services as well. So all of that stuff running on the same clusters that we uh, sell, same topology, you know, same SRE team uh, in most of the cases, same SRE team. And um, yeah, so we take a lot of pride in being able to offer, uh, being kind of the front line. So delivering OpenShift goes through OpenShift dedicated, kind of the point of the, point of the conversation. Um, so pretty cool. And I would consider that the Red Hat way as well, um, that we put all of our eggs in our own software's basket because we trust it and uh, that gives us the best possible uh, signal, best possible um, feedback loop. So I've gone through the CLI overview and I've uh, deployed a, a cluster on GCP. I highly doubt we've got many updates to talk about yet. Yeah, no updates to it just yet. It's installing. Um, so let's keep moving. I wanted to show you, uh, uh, this product isn't released yet, but it's it's called Amazon Red Hat OpenShift. Um, announced it back in May, I believe. It's a collaboration between Red Hat and AWS. To my daughter, uh, it's a collaboration between AWS and Red Hat to build a first party AWS service to deliver OpenShift through, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, through AWS's console. Absolutely fantastic. Been a been a tremendous uh, amount of effort to build, and we're we're getting there. We're getting there for sure. So the service is working internally, <laughs> working internally here. Um, it's not GA as I mentioned, uh, <clears throat> but let's try and deploy one of those clusters. Uh, where do we go? So that uses a slightly different command line utility, incidentally, um, <clears throat> but it is still talking to OCM. OCTL, actually, let me show you some of the options here. They look very familiar because they are built on the same SDK in the back end, the same OCM SDK in the back end. There's some additional features um, that we've added to MoSCTL. Um, And we can stream those logs back to your CLI using using that watch option. There's a bunch of stuff, bunch of cool stuff to kind of get a better <clears throat> status of what's happening of your installation. Uh, this is all available on cloud.reddit.com. So I'll, I'll show you the, the web side of this in a minute or two. But uh, let's let's do something a little bit different here. Um, let's create a cluster in interactive mode. So I'm going to pass the flag double dash interactive there. 
I'm going to give it, uh, uh, since I specified the name on the command line, didn't have to, um, it's defaulting to that. So devconf amro, which stands for Amazon Red Hat OpenShift, uh, jeter, <clears throat> this is my cluster name. Uh, multiple availability zones, sure. Let's do multiple AZs in this one. And it is now validating my uh, AWS credentials, which are inside. So I've got the AWS CLI uh, installed and configured on my workstation. And <clears throat> the most CTL utility is using those credentials to, um, to authenticate against AWS's API so that it can create resources within that account. Resources being the, the OpenShift cluster itself, nodes, ELBs, everything else. Um, I get a choice of which region to do it. I prefer US West, West 3. And I can choose a version. Um, in this case, I don't know, 4416. Let's go with that one. I can choose which type of instances that I want. Um, probably leave this as, well, no, let's change it. Let's go with the R5. X large instance type. Um, yeah, that should work. And it, you'll notice here the default number of compute nodes is nine. And the way that ends up is uh, there are three in each availability zone. So it spreads them out. So that if there were an AZ failure, you have uh, a certain amount of compute left over on all of the other ACs. Okay, so we'll go with nine. I don't have a, a reason to customize the networking on this cluster, so I'm going to skip those three, uh, sorry, four options. Uh, I'm not going to make the cluster private because I can't peer into it from my house very easily. <laughs> um, but you can also toggle this after installation, no problem. So you can go from public to private and from private back to public for both the API uh, and the ingress, so the router itself. You can set those independently um, at any time uh, during the... Uh, clusters life. So that's actually a, uh, there's actually a major project for service delivery. Uh, a, a, it's something we add on top of OpenShift by popular demand from customers saying, look, we're, we have to have private clusters. So wasn't a feature of OpenShift uh, at the time when we were building this service. And um, again, because of the popular demand, our uh, SRE team has implemented private clusters and exposed it through the UI um, as well. So I'm going to choose no here, which is the default. And now it is creating my uh, Amazon Red Hat OpenShift cluster. Again, not a GA service, can't do this yourself today, um, but it's doing it. So <clears throat> I can now type most ETL uh, list clusters. In this case, you can see before I do that, a bunch of output here, just a little bit of helper uh, text. Most ETL list clusters is there. Um, it, it asks you if you want to create an IDP, I will, um, probably skip that step for this demo, but you can, you can, um, authenticate to the cluster via, um, you know, GitHub is probably the most popular one, but you can use Google or LDAP, um, anything that's supported by OpenShift actually. Uh, it tells me my AWS account number. It tells me the topology of the cluster. If you'll notice there's nine compute nodes, um, and its state is pending. So right now, pending just means that uh, the cluster service has transmitted the cluster deployment over to Hive, and we're either waiting on a slot on Hive or it's uh, it's going to pick it up. You know, usually picks it up within um, just a minute, a couple minutes. So if I go to uh, oh, the last thing I'll say, and I'll and I'll run this in a second is um, yeah, you can get the install logs, and I'll I'll just show you that briefly. So most ETL list clusters, I should see. Uh, at least one. Yeah, I've got two because I tested uh, tested this and delivered one cluster, which is already running. Um, and I'll show you that in the UI in a minute. This one now says state is installing. So it went from pending uh, to installing fairly quickly in that length of time. So now installing means there is a pod on the Hive cluster that is running the OpenShift install for the version that I chose, which was 4.4.16 um, uh, with the install configuration that I passed, uh, that I also passed. So it was the R5X large, it was multi-AZ, it was the number of compute nodes and so forth. Um, that was all passed through to Hive and it is and it is, it is now running. It says it's installing. So that takes a bit. And uh, if I wanted to know what it's doing, I can just simply copy this command uh, and run most ETL logs install. 
So there's either install or uninstall uh, the name of the cluster and then watch. And then I mentioned earlier that we're streaming the hive uh, the install logs from the hive um, cluster back through cluster service and eventually to your command line client here. So we can watch the installation logs. <clears throat> And these are just regular OpenShift install logs. You can see right now, because it's uh, an AWS cluster, it's creating a whole ton of AWS resources in here for us. Uh, and this will continue for a bit while the cluster is being um, installed. Okay, so while this cluster is installing, I can safely control C out of that. Uh, the install will still progress in the background. It should still be an installing state. Mm -hmm. I wanted to show you, uh, I mentioned I stood up another uh, cluster as part of this demo. I wanted to show you how you can edit this cluster, um, edit an existing cluster, uh, the attributes of it after it's running. So let's try uh, MoCTL edit cluster. Oh boy. <clears throat> this is the one um, that's already been installed. And I will also edit this in interactive mode. You could just as easily um, pass whatever flags you wanted to to the uh, the edit function right now, um, but I'll do it. I'll do uh, interactive mode. So the first thing it'll ask me in interactive mode is whether I want to flip the cluster to private mode. Uh, I mentioned don't want to do that uh, for myself. Uh, enable cluster admins. That's uh, defaulted to yes, which means I can assign that role to any user that's in my IDP. For me, for example, my GitHub user could be cluster admin within uh, this cluster. I'll leave that. Uh, changing the number of compute nodes. Um, by the way, this demo cluster that I created uh, prior to this uh, yesterday um, was not multi-AZ. <clears throat> So that's why it has five compute nodes on it now. Otherwise it would be a minimum of nine. Uh, but in this case, let's make it, um, you know, six compute nodes. So we'll add one <coughs> and it's going to do that. So now let's see if I can bring up um, a web browser and show you what it looks like there. Okay, so this is cloud.reddit.com. I mentioned um, OCM and this is, uh, this is the list of clusters that I personally have installed in this environment. Um, so I've got a couple that are already installed, the, uh, the, the GCP one and the um, AMRA one are, uh, you can currently see they're in installing mode in the locations or regions that I chose. So for example, EU West 3 translates to uh, to Paris. Um, and US East 1, where I put the GCP cluster, is Monk's Corner, uh, South Carolina, US. So those are both installing. We've got my other clusters that are already installed. Um, let's pull up the cluster that I just scaled, which is uh, JEater AMRO 4510. And if I dig into this cluster, uh, you'll see it's ready and that it has now uh, the number six compute nodes. Um, <clears throat> you can see this is desired nodes versus actual. So when you scale a cluster, it takes a couple minutes to provision it and to join it to the OpenShift cluster, which is what's happening in the background here. Um, and so it, actual nodes is still five. And then a couple of minutes from now, this will update itself and there'll be there'll be six nodes um, in that cluster. And you would see that represented in the number of vCPUs and the number uh, the amount of memory available. So this is what OCM, the web UI looks like. I mentioned earlier the uh, that the account management service um, had a change log for a cluster. We call it the um, service log internally, but <clears throat> you can see here that the history of this cluster. So for example, uh, it was born on the 18th of September and uh, we changed the number of compute nodes we added an identity provider. I did. <clears throat> um, I added my user to the cluster admin. So you can see here this this J, Jeremy Eater, that's my uh, GitHub handle, and uh, has been added to cluster admin. So <clears throat> when I log in to OpenShift, which I'll do in just a sec, 
I will use, it will authenticate against GitHub and I will have uh, full administrative uh, rights on this cluster. And then finally, um, adding more, uh, more compute nodes. You can see here, this is the action that we just took um, where the compute nodes have been updated to six. So I'll just quickly show you, it's not super important, but I, I will quickly show you how uh, to um, log into the cluster. Uh, incidentally, so this isn't really an OCM demo, but there's a bunch of other features here. For example, connecting the VPC or making things public or private is really just as simple as clicking this, uh, ticking this box and clicking change. You could do that via the command line as well. Um, if you remember earlier, there was a prompt for private cluster in the interactive mode of most ETL edit. It's the same thing as this website. It's all talking back to the same APIs. So if I click, excuse me, so if I click um, open console, I will be presented with the normal OpenShift um, login screen. You'll notice that there was no SSL pop-up. That is because we, um, when we provision clusters, we go, as I mentioned earlier, we give you a DNS zone, a Route 53 DNS zone, or uh, or Google there, a uh, DNS provider, and we um, we go and request a certificate for you. And again, we lifecycle that certificate, so it won't expire. It's all automated. Um, here you see a list of the uh, IDPs that are configured. In my case, I named it GitHub One, so I'll click there, um, and I will log in. And I believe I will need my token. Sorry about this. Let's get a token going. You should all be running two-factor. Uh, let's see, GitHub. Cool. We are in. And so, yeah, here's the OpenShift console. This is what every OpenShift cluster looks like. That's what uh, an OpenShift dedicated cluster looks like. That's what a, uh, in this case, this is an AMRO cluster. Um, so just a default screen. And I'm in as, as cluster admin through that uh, IDP integration. Cool. So here you could look at things like, if I, if I looked at events just quickly, just to show you what's happening um, in the background, you can see that uh, my cluster is adding that node. So it's all coming together. And I believe if I went to compute and then um, machine sets, you'll see I have six of six machines here. I don't know if you can be a little bit tough to read, but it, I find it, it has finally added that node to the cluster is my point. We started with five um, and now we've got six. So cool, let's move on. Um, so back to the terminal and uh, let's get the slides going again. So how do we manage, um, how do we manage these clusters? Let's talk about that. So first of all, OpenShift itself, OpenShift 4 is a drastic change in operability from um, OpenShift 3. We, through the acquisition of CoreOS, have a much more automated self-driving, self-healing platform than we had with OpenShift 3. And users of OpenShift 3 should be able to vouch for that. Um, day two operations, such as I mentioned, life cycling certificates, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, monitoring and so forth are, are things that we add onto the platform. And of course, a deep understanding of the cloud provider internals. Um, you know, the intersection of OpenShift and the cloud provider is of, you know, is of, is of interest to any platform team. So some of the day two stuff that we add to, uh, uh, to help build this service and to manage these clusters we have. So the left side of this, uh, of this chart is what we have running on our uh, management plane clusters. So we have the Hive service, obviously. Um, we also have a pager duty operator. And so our SRE team uses pager duty for managing alerts and so forth. So we um, wrote an operator that, um, that configures pager duty and then we'll uh, lay that secret down inside the uh, the actual cluster. We also, uh, you know, have a Let's Encrypt certificate service and um, the DNS integration that I mentioned earlier. So that runs inside our management plane. What's running on the cluster is we lay down certain permissions um, that allow us to manage the cluster that allow um, uh, different tiers of roles to be, you know, configured by uh, the owner of the cluster. Uh, so I mentioned cluster admins earlier. There's also a 
sort of a mid tier called dedicated admins can do can install operators can do quite a bit but not um, the full kind of cluster admin stuff. Um, we also do obviously backups of etcd for recovery of the cluster itself not not the application data but recovery of the cluster itself and we have a set of alerts um that we also add on top of what the openshift product adds so just wanted to talk a little bit more deeply about monitoring um observability is key for any sre team it's near and dear to my heart as well um, but this is what the monitoring stack looks like on every OpenShift cluster, whether it's managed or not, looks like this. Um, so the OpenShift team develops all of these components and uh, yeah, they're controlled by an operator called the cluster monitoring operator. All of this data, or I should say, it's, all of this data is available in cluster. Um, tremendous amounts of data are available in clusters and uh, they're visualized in the web UI as well. Um, and they also call back to our telemetry service that I mentioned earlier. So a subset of this data, just kind of the uh, key performance indicators that you know we as a software vendor are interested in learning across our fleet, such as the health of the cluster, whether there's uh, operators are malfunctioning, um, whether an upgrade succeeded, that kind of stuff. Um, but this is what it looks like. So we run other components under that operator, like the Prometheus node exporter, um, Prometheus itself, obviously, uh, cube state metrics, which gets us some additional data collection. Uh, Grafana is on each cluster and um, and alert manager. So the, this product also configures alert manager with um, that. That's where the pager duty integration um, lives. And uh, yeah, I mentioned the telemeter client also, which is what's uh, running on each cluster that you know transmits those uh, key performance indicators of uh, the cluster's health. So that's how the cluster monitoring operator works. And our team, um, yes, yeah, so here's a snapshot of the, the telemetry data that comes back. Uh, I've redacted any, anything sensitive, obviously. Um, but this cluster is running on AWS, it's version 4.4. Its availability is currently 100% um, within the time frame, obviously, of this, of this snapshot. And uh, there's 42 nodes in this cluster. So kind of a, and it's running version 4.4.16. So this is the kind of data that we get back. Uh, we're looking at, um, the number of uh, nodes in the cluster to see kind of where's the sweet spot for what most people are doing um, with these clusters, you know, uh, how often updates are performed. You can see this one had an upgrade that was done um, about a week ago. So that would be, it would be pretty close to the latest version. Um, and then the number of etcd objects, we also pull that back because, you know, if that goes sideways, um, that's, that's a pretty, I should say, uh, easy to detect issue that you can prevent. Um, you can prevent issues with your cluster if you're if you're tracking that sort of thing. Cool. So moving on, I mentioned the pager duty integration earlier. So we've got that whole monitoring stack um, across every cluster that is uh, under management. They all feed back to pager duty, and uh, yeah, it's a twenty four by seven SRE team, uh, as you might imagine. So people all over the place. Um, um, you know, again, using PagerDuty to consolidate the alerts and take action upon them. Okay, cool. So let's finally talk about um, uh, how a, a production application that we're running. I mentioned earlier the uh, OpenShift update service. Um, I called it Cincinnati and uh, it's just a code name. I wanted to use that as the example today. Um, you by the time you're seeing this um you already missed unfortunately or maybe some didn't uh a, a deep dive into the cincinnati onboarding into um our managed environment uh by aditya canardi and vadim radkowski the recording will be available it was a, a couple hours ago i, I think um, but they did a deep dive into this and i'll, I'll cover it a little bit of a higher level but this is a, a, an application that runs on our managed fleet, all of the stuff that I mentioned earlier is true, and, and there's there's some content, some really cool stuff that this team has done together. Uh, with so the development team has done along with the SRA team to um, improve the application's performance, and improve the application's availability, uh, improve their development processes to kind of suit um, what the ops teams, the SRA teams need. Just a tremendous example. Highly recommend watching their video. Um, okay, so anyway. Uh, 
the OpenShift update services job is simply to return the available, they call them edges, the available upgrade paths for the version that you're on right now. So I'm on 4.4.16. What is my path to 4.5? Uh, this service will, will calculate and, uh, and just send that back to you. So stateless, uh, stateless application, I should mention. It also ties back to, uh, here it's called Toolbooth. That's the code name for uh, the account management service. But when you call in, yeah, you know, we verify obviously who uh, entitlements and so forth um, at that time. So that is the overview of the OpenShift uh, update service. Um, yeah, kind of went through most of this earlier. There's different channels. I don't know how much uh, we need to get into here, but you can have a candidate channel, fast channel, stable channel. Um, and these are all different levels of risk associated with kind of came from CoreOS's um, approach to in Tectonic, where there's kind of different levels of, of risk um, for your cluster. So I think the intent is that folks will run um, uh, some portion of their clusters on the fast channel, um, some portion of their clusters on um, even on candidate channel, if they have the flexibility to do that <clears throat> and use that to make sure that their applications are ready for the next version itself, just like beta testing. Um, so yeah, that's what Cincinnati does. Um, cool. So some of the stuff that this team came up with together is really just gold mining, uh, bringing this application on. And I know a lot of users of Kubernetes struggle with these areas. I, uh, uh, so, Let's, let's look at what the perfect deployment might be. Um, there's, it's a partnership and you have to understand what Kubernetes is capable of, how it behaves, as well as how OpenShift applies updates to a cluster in order to make sure your application takes advantage of the right features and your application is designed in such a way to, to, to leverage those features in the, in the most pragmatic way, quite honestly. Um, so, so for example, in a stateless application, we don't have to worry about storage, um, so which this application is, again, in memory database. Um, it's, it's okay to run more than one replica and have that load balanced behind um, HA proxy, which is what OpenShift uses to load balance, um, uh, sorry, applications. And, you know, our, our requests and limits set, what is your upgrade strategy? So when you roll out a new version um, does it drain connections and slowly roll uh, slowly roll out that change across your replica set? Um, liveness and readiness probes are are very important. So if, if a pod is malfunctioning, uh, the router will eventually not send traffic to those pods. Uh, pod disruption budgets also important so that the application stays up. Um, if nodes are you know coming and going and so forth, uh, it will maintain um, availability of the application. And that can actually interrupt or delay, I should say, upgrades if there's only so many nodes on a cluster and depending on how your uh, disruption budget is configured. Anti-affinity, just to make sure the uh, pods are not running on the same node. So, <laughs> you know, let's say you have uh, 10 replicas. If six or seven of them end up on one node and that node um, runs into issues, then that capacity would be, um, you know, you would be down that, that percent of capacity, which is maybe not, maybe not what you want. So using pod anti-affinity will spread them around. Um, kind of, yeah, hopefully self-explanatory. Uh, and then things like using deprecated APIs uh, over the last couple of releases, the Kubernetes upstream has been, um, you know, rotating out beta APIs and alpha APIs and that, you may, that may actually be in use in your applications. Um, and being able to, to know that those are used by an application is important as well. So that's the Kubernetes side. The application also has to make some changes or at least be designed in a, in a, uh, in a way that can take advantage of them. So uh, the application needs to export loads of metrics, hopefully based on SLIs and, and SLOs that have business agreement with them, um, and that the application has been tested to be able to sustain its own SLOs during a cluster upgrade. So for example, um, I mentioned, you know, you've got 10 replicas. If two or three of them go away because they're being rescheduled um, or a node fails, you know, do, can you maintain those SLOs while your uh, while the cluster is either under stress or while upgrades are occurring, for example? So how can we possibly make it easier to do all of that stuff? Um, one of the SRE teams uh, in service delivery has put together a prototype <clears throat> 
Um, we're just simply calling it deployment validation operator. Uh, just in the last couple of weeks have put it in operator hub and it is going to, so we have some internal projects that already do this, but our idea is to put that all out in the community and then become consumers of that community code. Just, uh, you know, the Red Hat way, quite honestly, it's a good example of that. So we had some kind of early starts in this area. When we onboard new products into uh, our managed services fleet, we want them to take advantage of all of these things so that their, uh, their application has the highest possible availability. And, in, and you know, we're not receiving pages for application downtime when uh, we could have easily avoided it by config. So we want a way to be able to tell development teams uh, programmatically what, uh, what their current state of, uh, you know, what their current state is and capabilities and continuously validate that on a, on a cluster. So the deployment validation operator is an early start um, and I would encourage you to take a look at it. If you just go to Operator Hub and, and search for it, you'll find it um, and early start in this area. It's only got a handful of checks in it right now, <clears throat> but the teams are slowly moving um, the majority of those checks into the, uh, into the DBO operator. Yeah, so I hope the DVO uh, gets some more eyeballs on it to kind of make it useful for more uh, more workloads and scenarios. Um, so our clusters are ready. You can see them in the console here. Uh, they've gone from installing to ready. And if I were to look on the command line and my logs have ended with an install completed successfully message. So in this talk, we've, uh, you know, we've covered how we provision clusters. We talked about the microservices behind our service uh, delivery management plane. I've showed you how to showed you how to provision clusters on GCP and talked about uh, an upcoming Amazon Red Hat OpenShift product and talked about the monitoring and observability that we have built into OpenShift and the PagerDuty integration that our SRA team used. That's how we manage the fleet at scale. And then finally, we talked about the uh, uh, OpenShift update service and how we've tried to help that team uh, deliver the, the perfect deployment. So that's what I have for you today. Thanks for joining. Um, I appreciate your time. And uh, if you like what you've seen, consider subscribing and smash that like button. Happy DevConf. Thank you for